for you to hear, um, I hope, a more erudite uh, campaign uh, views from the yes and the no sides than we've perhaps seen from the official yes and no campaigns, which has really shared, I think, probably more heat than light on the issues. The quality have, of the debate has been terrible. Um, most of the claims that have been made by both campaigns have been either exaggerated or false. Uh, the Yes campaign argues, at least in its more exuberant moments, that AV would eliminate safe seats. Clearly, AV would not eliminate safe seats, though it would reduce their number a little bit. The Yes campaign says that AV would clean up politics. Uh, there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that AV would clean up politics. Um, the Yes campaign says that uh, AV would make MPs work harder. Um, well, it might make those MPs whose seats are no longer safe work a little bit harder, uh, but that's not very many MPs. And actually, by work harder, what they mean is work harder on servicing their constituents, which it doesn't, it, it doesn't equate to working harder in general. Um, and in particular, if that takes time away from MPs fulfilling their important tasks in Westminster of holding the government to account and scrutinizing what it's up to, then that may well be a problem for our democracy. The No Camp has claimed that uh, AV violates the principle of one person, one vote, which it does not. Uh, in each round of counting the votes under AV, everyone's vote counts once and never more than once. The No Camp says that AV leads to permanent coalitions, would create King Clegg, um, and AV would probably slightly increase the frequency of coalitions, slightly, but it certainly wouldn't need to lead to permanent coalitions. Their third claim is that AV would cost a lot of money. Um, and indeed, it's reasonable to say that AV would cost a little bit more than first past the post. Counting would take a little bit longer. There would certainly be some transition costs. The £250 million figure that they produce, however, is pure fiction. There are, however, um, good arguments, both for and against AV. Uh, in favour of AV, you could point out that it gives voters a little bit more choice, which, uh, given that voters are no longer so attached to a single party, is probably a good thing for quite a few of them. You could point out that AV makes it a bit more likely that the majority of voters in a constituency are able to decide the outcome uh, in that constituency. On the no side, you can perfectly legitimately point out that AV probably increases the likelihood of coalitions, and AV also increase, increases the likelihood of landslides, um, and uh, makes, uh, would tend to make landslides even bigger than they are already. Tony Blair's landslide in 1997 would have been even bigger than it was yeah. under First Past the Post. <laughs> and most people would say that that is a bad thing that it would have been very difficult for the Conservatives to hold the government to account had Blair had the sort of landslide that AV might well have given him. So there are good arguments on both sides, uh, but we don't really hear them terribly much. The narrow uh, circles of the two campaigns have got, have got extremely passionate uh, on the issue of AV. However, the public have not engaged in any serious way. No one has managed to engage the public significantly. Therefore, we're very likely to see a victory for first past the post in the referendum voting. All of this was entirely predictable. It was entirely predictable that the campaign would be terrible, that no one would really engage, and that the no side would win. And much as we might well, in the coming days, assuming things goes, go as we expect, hear all sorts of... Uh, claims about the incompetence of the Yes campaign, their, their uh, dilettante nature compared to the bruisers of the No campaign. The reality is that the structure of the situation made it very difficult for the Yes campaign to win uh, in, in, in this situation. Now, we know from experience around the world that it is possible to engage the public with the electoral system. It happened in New Zealand and in Italy in the early 1990s. It happened to a slightly lesser extent in uh, Japan around the same time, but it's possible to engage the public only if three conditions are satisfied. Firstly, the public have to be angry about the state of politics, and they have to believe that the failings of the political system are harming their own personal interests. 
Secondly, there has to be a plausible case for saying that changing the voting system would do something about the sources of the public's anger. And thirdly, there have to be some prominent politicians making that link, making that case between the voting system and the things that people care about. Now, I think the third of those, the existence of politicians making the case, isn't really uh, what the, the, the difficulty is here for the Yes campaign. There are lots of politicians uh, pushing for voting reform. The problem for the Yes campaign is clearly that um, the anger isn't there and the connection uh, with the voting system isn't there. What people care about clearly is the economy, the state of the economy, and the state of the, the, the public services and the cuts. And no one suggests that the structure of our political system is to blame for the state that the economy is. Contrast this with the situation currently in Ireland, in Iceland, to a lesser extent in Greece, where there are major debates about political reform taking place because a lot of people think that the political system failed um, and that that contributed to the mismanagement that led to the economic uh, uh, crises. Uh, no such connection has been made in the UK, which leads me on to a uh, final point, um, which is... Uh, it, we have the particular choice of AV in this referendum, there is no plausible uh, uh, case for saying that any problem that the public cares about can be solved by the introduction of AV. You just can't do it. There is no, no argument that could possibly be made there that an issue that the public actually care about could be solved by AV. And the consequences of all of that are what we have seen. We've seen very low public engagement. We've, uh, we can see that few people really understand the issues. Therefore, the campaigns can get away with talking a lot of nonsense because no one really understands. And what if we know anything from research on referendums around the world, it is that people who don't understand the reform option that they're being offered don't see why it's good for them vote for the security of the status quo. The problem with AV is it's a bit like um, a small group of spotty adolescents uh, playing Dungeons and Dragons who are then asked by, uh, by uh, one of their mothers what they're doing and they say, oh, we're, we're, we're studying medieval history and, uh, uh, and warfare. What's happened is a very small bunch of not so spotty uh, academic experts um, have very strong views about, uh, about the best design of electoral systems, uh, and suddenly they've been asked what they're doing. So they say, they say oh, well, we're designing the best possible uh, electoral system for this country, and it will solve all your problems. Um, and that, uh, of course, uh, as Dr. Rennick has explained, has led to uh, exaggerated uh, claims uh, on both sides. So I won't make any exaggerated claims. I think it is uh, a perfectly sensible uh, system. I mean, in fact, I think it is the only, uh, it is the best uh, electoral system, uh, purely from the point of view of the voter. Uh, I regard it as an insult to my intelligence to be presented with a ballot paper and expected to mark it with a, uh, with, with an, with a cross which is designed for a semi-literate peasant, uh, when I'm perfectly capable of having, uh, having views about all uh, six, eight, or however many candidates there are on the, on the ballot paper, and I'm capable of counting up to six or eight and uh, ranking them in order of preference. However, but I, I accept that this is a minority interest of mine because I'm interested in politics and that actually most people uh, don't uh, have, that, uh, have that interest. They don't particularly want to fill in uh, the ballot paper right down to um, you know, the, the seventh or the 17th choice. Um, but there's no harm, in my view, in having a system which allows people to express however many preferences they want. Uh, and the, the problem, obviously, with the existing system is that, uh, that you are forced to make um, tactical uh, guesses about what other people are going to do. However, um, you will have heard all the arguments for and against AV, so I'm not going to bore on about them. All I can do is reflect on the referendum campaign and why it was such a disappointment. I'm told that um, Eric Fromm, who was a, a social psychologist, once wrote, a, wrote an essay uh, just after the war called The Struggle Against Pointlessness. Uh, and I think um, if I were to write an assessment of the, uh, of the referendum campaign, that would be my title. Uh, in order to get away from the pointlessness, pointlessness of it all, I think um, 
people, the small minority of people who did feel strongly about it were forced <coughs> to make ever more improbable claims for uh, one system or the other. The fact is, as Henry Kissinger said about why student politics is so vicious, um, the problem is that the stakes are so small. Uh, there is very little difference between uh, AV and first past the post, uh, either in the practical outcome. I mean, if you look back at the history of, uh, of elections in Australia, it's very difficult to suppose that they would have been any different under, uh, under first past the post. Uh, they haven't had uh, hung parliaments uh, very often uh, either. Indeed, they haven't had them at all. Uh, apart from the last election. It's always the last election which provides the, the most uh, curious uh, counterfactual uh, because, you know, first past the post doesn't provide many uh, hung parliaments in, in this country, although it has provided more than in Australia. And, of course, the last election was the one where it, uh, where it provided one smack in the middle. We shouldn't be regarding it uh, from, the, from the point of view of the consequences. Are, are hung parliaments more likely? Are coalitions more likely? Will MPs behave differently? And so on. I, I prefer to see it entirely from the point of view of the voter, uh, in that I think it gives, it gives voters uh, the chance to express themselves more fully, uh, more democratically. Yes, it allows uh, supporters of the BNP to put the BNP as their first preference. And I say, if it, it is better that we know how many people there are in our society who, whose first preference is the BNP, uh, especially if you do it under a system in which the BNP is even less likely to be elected uh, than under the, the first, under the present system. Uh, but as I say, all these differences are small, uh, and, the diff and the consequences are very small, and the consequences are unforeseeable because you don't know how people might vote under a different system. I hope the, 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 those of you remaining who haven't yet voted uh, will vote uh, to give yourselves more choice, more freedom of expression, and more control of your politicians. Most of the people who back AV uh, do so either because they want to dish the Conservative Party because they, uh, so they think that the electoral calculations will favour a, a, a sort of progressive alliance or because they see it as a saving stone, stepping stone to reform that is properly proportional that in which you know, the number of people who vote for a particular party is reflected by the number of seats they get at Westminster. Another thing I agree on with John is that most of the effects of AV are, are sort of lower order. I don't think it's going to result in rains of frogs and plagues of darkness. But I think the, the negative effects do actually sort of stack up enough that it's quite seriously, it, it, you know, there are serious disadvantages to, to it compared with, compared with the system we have at the moment. I mean, the, the great reason to vote for AV is, as John says, the, the, the choice that so many people feel that frustration from being stuck in a safe seat where they, you know, I mean, I come from a town called Whitney whose MP is David Cameron. And <laughs> if you want to vote anything other than Tory, there's, there's no point at all. Although under AV, if you wanted to vote anything but Tory, there'd be no point at all either. Um, you know, I do think, yes, people do have different preferences, although there's, there's an important point which uh, Dr. Rennick raises in his thesis, which is by the time you've counted quite a, lot of, quite a lot of the votes, you're getting to a stage where sort of sixth or seventh choices are being given the same weight as a first choice. In other words, your sort of vague liking for a candidate's, you know, whether you just like his tie or like his name, is being given the same weight as the fact that you really absolutely agree with someone's programme. And I, I'm not quite sure how... I think quite a lot of people would feel that that was unfair as the in, in really quite tight, tight contests. One of the important things is it, at the constituency level, is it changes the dynamic from voting for the person you most like to voting for the person you least hate, that the candidates which tend to get in are, are sort of the ones which can grab as many second, third and fourth preferences as possible. And that is, is, quite, is, is in a way a recipe for quite mushy politics. It's a way, recipe for bland people, for inoffensive people. And it, it would also deprive politics and the House of Commons of quite a lot of people who are you know, sort of more interesting and radical and, and charismatic and are prepared to do and say quite bold things on, on, on either side. And I think that would be a, I think that sort of, that increasing blandness would be quite bad for our, for our politics. Um, the other thing uh, which hasn't been mentioned is tactical voting at a constituency level. In that AV doesn't eliminate tactical voting, which is one of the more idiotic promises made by the Yes campaign, it, um, it makes it slightly more complicated because party order becomes more important. If you were asked at the end of this to vote for the, the, one of the three of us under AV, and we all got roughly a third of the vote, if it turned out that people who voted for me would then put John as their second choice because he's a journalist and they like journalists, whereas people who voted for John would put, you know, would, would share their second preferences equally. 
it then becomes in Alan's interest to ensure that I am the order in which we are knocked out then matters hugely because AV isn't approval voting. It's not a case that everyone you express a preference for gets every preference you express gets counted. It 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 goes it goes in order of elimination. So that if if John was knocked out th first and half his votes went to each of us, then the result would be in doubt. If I was knocked out first and all my votes went to John, then then Alan's likely to lose. You get some really quite complex scenarios. And in, in Australia, we've seen uh, vote party voting cards where parties say to you, please rank please rank people in this order because, to manipulate the order in the way we'd like. And that's something which we are definitely going to see here if we get AV, because I know the Tories have been sort of trying to draw some up in the, you know, just in case. And each, so, each, so we, and again, like... As with the, the hung parliament issue, that hands power to the politicians of, over the people because, you, you know, not everyone's going to vote according to the voting card, but quite a lot of people are because they're going to be have a strong enough affiliation with the Tory party, say, to do what the Tories say. The BBC has been, and the uh, and with various experts, has been doing a survey for the last 20 years asking people, if you'd had a second preference, how would you have voted? Uh, and I know that assumes that you'd have, your first preference would have been the same, but it's quite a good referendum ready yardstick. And um, what you'd see, say, in 97, which is the great counterexample to this, is that, yes, Tony Blair would have got a massively increased majority, but the Tory party would have got uh, about 45 fewer seats than the Lib Dems, with about twice as much of the share as the first preference vote. Yes, the current system is unfair to the Lib Dems, and that's its great unfairness, but by trying to fix it, you in introduce even greater unfairness towards either the Tories or Labour. The things which people have flagged up as being wrong with our system are wrong with our system, but AV, as both, as both of my fellow panellists have said, doesn't address them. And I think there are the, the sort of tragedy of this referendum is it's obscured all the other ways we could actually improve things. We could have much, we could have recall elections to uh, to sort of vote people out in in midterm. We could have open open primaries, as I said, where everyone in the constituency can vote for a particular candidate rather than just their party members. And you can have um, more more plebiscites. You can have a thing where if something reaches a certain level on the number ten website, it has the the petitions website. Although I'm not sure whether it's still going actually. But um, you know, then it has to be debated in Parliament and given a decent airing. And all those are much better ways to enable people to reconnect with their democracy than uh, than AV.